praise the Lord, God's children, because uh, grace and peace be unto you because of uh, the day that it is. Hallelujah. It's a day that the Lord has made. And I just want you to understand that our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ also sends their grace. You know, I always thank God on your behalf for His grace. In all the things that you are uh, involved in, you, that you would be enriched by Him. So you won't be lacking in any gift. You know, I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to the Master's Touch Master Class. <clears throat> These classes, my friends, are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God. And if you can't make it at the time of our broadcast, then know that these messages are archived for your study convenience right here on Spreaker.com. Also on our website, themasterstouch.org. God bless you richly as we begin our, uh, uh, to enter into God's presence. So let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to join us. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. It's flowing through our lips, Lord. We exalt and praise you and your holy name. And Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for you and thirsting for you. To know your word and to know your will, we praise you for our Lord and Savior, your only Son, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, your rhema word, the logos word, and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as we impart, as you impart your wisdom through your word into us. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. My friends, did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. So elevate that expectation level. You know, uh, and you're going to come away when you do with a greater revelation and a greater heart and mind connection. Today we're going to be continuing our series on the end times as we go line upon line and precept upon precept through the book of Revelation Explained. Now today we're going to be talking uh, about Lesson 16. Revelation chapter 16 describes the final seven vials of the wrath of God. And I'll be talking to you about that. But before I do, I want you to understand that I'm going to be giving you the scripture in the King James, and then I'll be giving you the explanation after it. We go back through and break it down So if, for understanding. So we're going to be going into chapter 16 of the book of Revelation, and it describes, like I said, the final seven vials of the wrath of God. And it's representing the climax of God's punishment of sinners during the tribulation period. No repentance is invited or shown. The judgments are somewhat parallel both to the ten plagues on Egypt and to the trumpets of the chapters uh, of chapters 8 and 9. All those trumpet judgments. Now the bowls are more total um, uni and universal in their effect than, they, than were the trumpets. Okay, And generally they affect the people more directly. Chapter 16, Revelation 16.1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. These seven angels, folks, each holding a bowl containing the judgments that are about to fall on earth, seem reluctant to cast forth their bitter judgments. However, they are obedient to the voice of God when he speaks. These bowls constitute what the Lord Jesus referred to as the great distress, Matthew 24, uh, verse 21, or the last 42 months of the tribulation period. Four of these seven judgments occurred literally in Egypt among the ten plagues. In addition, part of the sixth judgment, uh, that, that of drying up of the Euphrates River and producing frogs, was also literally fulfilled during the history of Israel. Frogs were generated as one of the plagues of Egypt, and both the Red Sea and Jordan rivers were rolled back so that God's people could walk forth on dry, dry ground. Therefore, nothing new will be transpiring when God dries up the Euphrates River in order that the kings of the east may march over on dry ground. If the plagues of Egypt were literal, and they certainly were, why shouldn't we expect these awful judgments as well to be literal? Think about it. Revelation 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. All right, this first bold judgment, foul and loathsome sores, when men choose to worship Antichrist rather than Christ and demonstrate their allegiance by accepting the mark of the beast, God responds by sending on them a plague of foul and loathsome sores. John makes it clear that these awful sores inflict only those who worship the Antichrist and who have accepted the mark of the beast. No tribulation saint suffers from them. Further, confirmation that the three judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials are sequential, not concurrent, is clarified in the time of this judgment. 
Antichrist will not be set up as the object of worship until the middle of the tribulation period, and this judgment falls on the human race because of their worship of Antichrist, which can only occur after the middle of the tribulation. So the recipients are the beast worshippers. The selection from among the peoples on the earth is clearly seen in this passage. Only those containing the mark of the beast and worshipping his image will be selected for those awful sores. This indicates that God, in his marvelous grace, will not bring judgment on believers during this latter half of tribulation, but will protect them as he did the Israelites during the plagues of Egypt. Now this further confirms that in the previous judgments, when he slays 25% and then another third of the world's population that's remaining, making a total of 50%, he will exempt believers. All right, Revelation 16, verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. All right, the second bowl judgment. Now the second angel pours out his bowl on the sea, and it turns into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea dies. We've already seen that God will cause a third part of the sea to turn to blood during the second trumpet, but this second bowl includes the entire sea. Imagine when all living creatures in the sea die. Think of the unbearable stench and the potential for disease. I mean, think about it. Ugh. The judgment may well interfere with commercial shipping and send whole populations into confusion as people grope for an adequate supply of water, not to mention destroying what's left of the fish industry. Revelation 16, verse 4, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. All right, the third bowl judgment, the third bowl, a sequel to the second, carries with it an interesting explanation as to why God will permit it. God will destroy the only remaining sources of water, folks, the rivers and fountains or springs of the deep, by letting them turn to blood. Whether this means literal blood or inconsequential, I mean, that's inconsequential, really. For if Christ can turn water to wine, he can certainly can turn water to blood. What is the significance that it will... Uh, that it bears here is that it will become corrupt blood which will breed disease and pestilence one of the basic needs of humankind is water and unless god provides water from another source or engineers by some process can turn this corrupted water into pure water the world will be in a state of riot and confusion seeking this necessi necessity of life <laughs> all of this describes devastation beyond what we can possibly comprehend the judgment of god has fallen and this does away with a good part of humanity Revelation 16, verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. Notice here, this is not the people saying that God is righteous. This is the angel saying God is righteous. At no time do the people repent. This is very odd, but think about it. At no time do these people repent. The angel here is saying that this judgment that God has brought is justified. The God mentioned here is the I Am. 16, verse 6, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Now it seems that the blood in their water supply is in punishment for the blood of the saints and prophets. Throughout the ages, the world and its evil system has been opposed to God and his people. Therefore, they deserve this punishment, folks. Revelation 16, verse 7, And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. As bad as these judgments are, they are deserved. As it was said before, everyone thinks, likes to think of God as love, but few remember also that he is the judge of the world. Thank God, thank God, thank God, his grace saved me. He is long-suffering, not willing that even one should perish. However, there is a day of reckoning when the God of the entire universe will judge fairly, and this seems to be that time. Revelation 16, verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Wow. I mean, think of it. Already there are billions of people that are dead, you know, and, and they stink. And the, well, there's no water anywhere. Um, the sun scorches now, now has the power to scorch men, and their mouths already parched from lack of water. Those who are unrepentant suffer even more intense thirst when God causes the sun to scorch them with great heat. But even this doesn't drive the rebels to their knees in repentance. Instead, they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. How right the angel was who said that uh, to God, true and righteous are your judgments in Revelation 16, verse 7. Like Pharaoh, their hearts have become hardened. And for evidence of Pharaoh's hardened heart and what happened then, look to Exodus chapter 7, verses 13, through 20, uh, 13 and 22. Uh, Exodus 8, 
uh, chapter 8, verse 15, 19, and 32, and Exodus 9, verse 7, 34 through 35. Now the environmentalists are telling us every day that we are destroying the ozone layer above the earth. Every time a person sprays their hair or uses an aerosol spray of any kind, it does away with ozone. The um, scientists tell us that the ozone layer is so thin that it might just go away altogether, and if it did, people would die by thousands from harmful rays from the sun that had not been filtered to make them safe. You see, God put this earth together very intricately, and man, in changing God's ways, has corrupted the atmosphere. An interesting thing to note in connection with this is this, that it takes a very, just a very thin coat of the shed blood of Jesus to protect us from the enemy. Wow, what a comparison. Revelation 6, verse, or 16, verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which has power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. With this type of rays from the sun, they would be covered with sores. This terrible plague is vented at the beast and its followers. The worst thing they could possibly do was curse God, and that is exactly what they did. They did not repent. Their hearts had been hardened. They either were not aware of God's power or just didn't want to give Him the glory. Either way, they are in trouble. Big trouble. This type of heat would, would burn up all the crops, cause droughts, and possibly even melt all the polar ice region. Revelation 16, verses 10 through 11, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. The fifth bowl of judgment, darkness. What's John talking about when he refers to the judgment falling upon the throne or seat of the beast of his kingdom? Well, it's probably best to think of the beast's throne as a reference to his entire kingdom, since his kingdom was full of darkness. And some see this to mean only the city of Babylon, but his kingdom will be worldwide. So notice also that tremendous darkness envelops the beast kingdom. And this seems, it's the same phenomenon uh, occurred in Egypt during the plagues, if you recall. The whole land was consumed in darkness, so oppressive that Moses said you could actually feel it. You know, that's the sort of thing that will come upon the kingdom of the Antichrist at this time. This divine judgment will give a physical illustration of their spiritual darkness. So you see, the beast may have control of evil men upon the earth, but he cannot control God or nature. The darkness here was not just physical darkness, folks, which is bad enough, but this darkness is of the spirit as well, bringing depression, attempted suicide, and all sorts of evil attacks on the mind. Two things indicated that this darkness will prevail for some time on earth, um, and the predictions of other prophets and the effects on the human beings. This judgment, a repetition of the nine plagues of, ninth actually plague of Egypt, is to be understood literally. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. Amos 5.18. And here's the other one. Who, will, uh, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. But with him, I'm, I'm sorry, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. Nahum, chapter 1, verses 6 and 8. Verses 6 and 8. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 15. Christ's own prediction was, but in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Mark 13 24. So the effects on the people described in Revelation 16.10, men nod their, their tongues in agony, indicate that relief from the heat will soon produce an exasperating, frustrating darkness. So keep in mind that human ingenuity in producing electricity may solve this problem, but consider as well that the water supply produces electricity, and with the tampering of the water supply, as seen in the second and third judgments, humanity may, may be incapable of continuing to draw electrical power and illumination from the bodies of water. These judgments are so clearly supernatural that everyone will know that they descend from the God of heaven. But instead of falling down before him to become the recipients of his mercy, people only cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Now they not only blaspheme God, but refused to change their ways. Let it be understood that those who reject the Lord do not uh, do so not because of philosophical doubts or unexplained answers to unanswered questions, but as a result of hardness of heart and love for sin. Okay, Revelation 16, verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. 
All right, the Six Bowl Judgment. Euphrates dried up. The Six Bowl Judgment comes in two parts. One, the drying up of the Euphrates River, which will be a preparation for the battle on the great day of, of God Almighty. And two, the tremendous demon forces that will bring the rebellious uh, armies of the world to the Valley of Megiddo for, um, or Megiddo, I guess you pronounce it, for the purpose of opposing the Lord. You see, the Euphrates River is the eastern border of the land God gave to Abraham. Genesis 15, verse 18. And it's about 1,800 miles long, so that uh, it's so large that it, you, it actually forms a natural barrier against armies of the world. Most people are not particularly conscious of the fact that it served as the eastern border of the Roman Empire. The Sixth Bowl Judgment will dry up that river to make way for the kings of the east. Now, when the Euphrates River, the natural boundary between east and west, is dried up, the kings from the east will march a sizable army across to battle with the king of kings. That army will probably be somewhere between three to five million strong. These forces will be joined in the Valley of Megiddo by huge armies from all over the world. And while that valley is vast, as Napoleon has said, the most ideal natural battlefield in the world, even it has a limit to how many people it can hold. <laughs> so, this river could have dried up because of the problems caused by some of the other vials. There will be such a drought that this waterway will dry up and these armies from the east will come into Israel on dry land. These kings from the east have befuddled Bible prophecy scholars for many years, for few scholars mentioned anything about them. That is, until the communists take over uh, of China, the communists take over of China after World War II. See, since then, it has become apparent that this largest of all countries by population has a prophetic role in the end-time events. China is controlled by some of the most dedicated communists in the world. They are not reformers or progressive, as our media tried to represent them a few years ago. They are a ruthless group of elite gangsters who have never wavered in their plan to use China as a military platform from which to conquer the world. The event, of, or the events, I should say, of... Um, the next two decades will, um, actually if indeed we have that long, <laughs> will prove that point. One thing we can be certain of, China is not going to go away. John the Revelator saw them as players on the world scene in the end times and spoke it out. Okay, even so the Bible has very little to say about China. In fact, what is said includes more than just China for terms of uh, uh, kings from the east really means kings for the rising sun, which would include Japan and possibly other Asian countries. It's realistic to believe that China would be led in these very days by her master, the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, to rebel against God, um, and that she would actually join the armies of the world in opposition to the coming of Jesus Christ. What's needed to bring her to that point? Well, very little, folks. Merely the deceiving spirit forewarned by John the Revelator. She is almost there today and could gain control of the entire Orient in ten or so years. Now remember, the events of Revelation, uh, Revelation 16 verse 12, do not take place until seven years after the rise of the Antichrist, which follows the rapture of the church. More than enough time to be fulfilled and just one more reason to believe Christ may return for his church in our generation. Revelation 16 verse 13. And I saw, um, just a second, I'm just looking at something, I'm sorry. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The three unclean spirits are demons who support the activities of Satan, the beast and the false prophet by means of miracles. They will convince the eastern kings and all the armies and kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather in Palestine to fight against uh, the second coming of Christ. Revelation 19.19. 19. This is Satan's final attempt to prevent Christ's return. And these unclean spirits will no doubt perform supernatural signs as part of their deception. Undoubtedly, they will work lying wonders to deceive the eastern kings, seducing them to make the difficult journey to their doom at Armageddon. Uh, Revelation 16, verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. To gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Hmm. This is the battle of Armageddon. 
You see, it tells you here that these are spirits of devils. In other words, they are the followers of the devil. Demons are the fallen angels who followed Lucifer out of heaven. These spirits of devils have power to do miracles, just like the Egyptian magicians copied some of Moses' miracles. Their power is limited just as was the Egyptians. When Moses threw his rod down, it became a snake. The Egyptians threw two rods down, they became snakes. The only difference was that Moses' snake swallowed theirs. So Exodus 7 verses 9 through 12 is your evidence for that. The uh, Bible says that at the end, the devil will have power enough to call down fire from heaven. His miracles will be so convincing that people will believe a lie. Think about how much power he's usurped from all of the unbelievers. I mean... Everybody who's in unbelief is buying into his program. They're deceived, and all their power that God has innately given it to them as inherent uh, power that comes with their birth into the natural world, uh, he has usurped. He's gained such momentum that it's just unbelievable. This is deception to the utmost, folks. These evil spirits are so deceiving that they convince these armies to come against Israel. They willingly come to the battle of Armageddon, believing they'll win. And this battle is literally the forces of evil coming against God himself. This war has actually been going on for centuries, but here we see the culmination of it all. Um, Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Now we see here that this comes unexpectedly. The garment spoken of here is the robe of righteousness. So we must not despair of his coming and fall away into sin. We need to walk in righteousness after we receive our robe of righteousness washed in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15 is an exhortation to the surviving believers to be watchful and alert. Matthew 24, verse 32, 25, uh, uh, 30, verse 32, and uh, chapter 25, verse 13. And to remain faithful and loyal to Christ during the time of intense persecution. To have garments rather than be naked relates to spiritual preparedness. Revelation 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called the Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Armageddon, the place where this great battle is to be fought, is in Israel. The blood will run as high up as a horse's bridle in this valley of Megiddo during this battle. All right, And this valley is also called Jezreel. Um, or Jezreel. They ha there, there have uh, already been 20 battles fought in this very spot, but never a battle of this magnitude. This battle will be the 21st 3 by 7, and 3, three times 7, and three, 3 means God, 7 means spiritually complete. God himself will settle the outcome of this once and for all. And this truly will be the war to end all wars. Shortly after this battle, Jesus will set up his kingdom. Now, um, Verse 16 identifies the place of the final battle as Armageddon. And from the Hebrew, Har Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, the hill country of Megiddo and the adjacent valley of Estralon have been the site of uh, many important battles, actually. Judges 515, 2 Kings 927, and, and 2 Kings 23, verse 29. Chapter 16, verses 17 through 19 of Revelation. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of, wine, of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. All right, this great voice out of the temple was probably God. In Genesis, when God made the earth in six days, when he said it is finished, when Jesus hung on the cross six hours, he said it is finished. That's just what this is. It's done, means here. All right. Uh, this is at the close of the 6,000 uh, 6, year days of work for the earth, just before the 1,000 year sab Sabbath of rest. God would be the one to decide. All right, the seventh bold judgment, the wrath of God. Then came flashing of flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. 
Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the si from the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of the hail, because the plague was so terrible. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl into an air, um, into the air, a voice will be heard from the temple of God before the throne, conveying a most welcome message. It is done. It is most welcome because it signifies the consummation of the tribulation, the conclusion of the day of God's wrath on the ungodly, the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. This final judgment of God will debut in the form of the world's greatest earthquake, one that has never occurred like it since man has even been on the earth. As prophesied in Haggai chapter 2, verses 6-7, through 7, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house, house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Now in chapter 11, verse 8, we see where the witnesses were killed, described as the great city. This is Jerusalem, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The massive earthquake will split Jerusalem into three parts. When the Mount of Olives splits in two, it will create a chasm into which the believers can seek refuge until that awful carnage is completed. This interesting, uh, it's interesting actually to note that uh, there is a fault line that runs under the Mount of Olives that moves in exactly the same direction that the Bible prophesies. Zechariah 14 verses 3 through 5 says this, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half the mountain will move toward the north, the other half toward the south, and you will flee by the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains will reach Ezel, Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. All right, Jerusalem is being prepared for the central role it plays during the millennial kingdom. This is where New Jerusalem will come down out of heaven and rest. In addition, cities of the nations collapsed, meaning that all the cities of the world will be destroyed. Chapter 16, verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. In addition, every island will vanish, and the mountains won't be found. This will indicate a complete renovation of the earth, which is a fulfillment of Second Peter 3, verse 10, that predicts that the entire earth will be destroyed, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. When it's done, the earth will basically be flat, with no seas, no islands, and no mountains, preparing it for restoration into something like it was in the pre-flood condition. Revelation 16, verse 21, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. <laughs> For the plague thereof was exceeding great. If there were not enough catastrophes, great hailstones weighing about 100 pounds apiece will come down out of heaven. It's difficult for us to conceive of hailstones that large, let alone the devastating effect they'll have on the people they hit. Remember what the Lord said in Job 38, verses 22 and 23. He's filled his armory full of hail and snow against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. Now, even now, these men do not repent. Instead, instead of repenting and asking God's help, they curse him. You see, in all of these plagues, God wants them, uh, while, while, all he wants from them, actually, is to repent and turn to him. God is so, so good. Did you receive this today? I pray that you did. If you have questions or need further assistance with understanding the message, please contact me. I'll give you my contact information. The website, www.themasterstouch.org. Email me at drstephanie at themasterstouch.org. That's my webmail. D-R-S-T-E-F like Frank E-N-I at themasterstouch.org. Master's Touch is my regular email, masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's Master's Touch HS at Cox.net. Poet at Cox.net, P O E T at Cox.net, or M T H S Prayer at Cox.net. That's M T H S Prayer at Cox.net. You know, I want to invite you to all to join us, uh, Pastor Karen Weitzman and myself, every Monday on Spreaker.com at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, following this program for Living the Word. Now, this is a program that teaches you how to apply the Word and promises of God to your life today. 
So come join us on Mondays at 10 a.m. Pacific Time on Spreaker.com and come expecting to receive. My friends, remember Proverbs 4 verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom and in all you're getting, get understanding. And that's exactly what we're doing here, dear ones. We are gaining God's wisdom. So be sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. The Master's Touch Masterclass is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. I'll see you again here in the Master's Class on Monday. And remember that to tune in following this program to Living the Word with Pastor Karen Weitzman and myself. God bless you. Mm -hmm.